Welcome everyone to Ascend's Women in Leadership chat with Julie. I am super excited to be here today with her. Julie is the best-selling author of Making of a Manager and co-founder of Sundial. Prior to that, she was vice president of design at Facebook. That's where she first became a manager at the young age of 25 with no training. And she has been at Facebook for almost 14 years. So she's seen it all. She has experienced scaling organizations, building teams, dealing with performance issues. She's been through it. And then what I love is she took all her learnings and put it in a book for us, broke it down into a playbook on how can you be a great manager in her book, Making of a Manager. CEOs and founders of top companies like Lyft, Slack, Twitter, rave about her book. They share their book with, her team, with their teams. It's that good. Today, we're going to talk about everything we wish we knew when we became a new manager and how do you lead with confidence in new and unexpected situations. I'm Shivani. I am the CEO and founder of Ascend. We offer an online leadership program for women. What inspired me to start Ascend was I used to be in your shoes. When I moved up into management, I learned how to get buy-in, advocate for myself, motivate my teams by all by making a ton of mistakes. Some guidance, primarily a lot of mistakes, similar to Julie. So I decided to create the leadership program I wish I had access to when I was making that transition into management. Our mission at Ascend is to elevate more women into leadership. I believe that's a big way we see the change that we need to see in today's work and places. And we're doing it. We've had women from companies like Google, Slack, Peloton, Twitter, gain confidence, move up faster in their careers, including getting promoted, and influence difficult stakeholders, even dominant personalities. So much of the program has been curated by senior leaders who have been in your shoes. I really think we need to have more open and honest conversations around what it takes to be successful as a new leader and how to excel in your career. That's why I'm so excited to be here with Julie. Julie, thank you so much for joining us. I love your book and I, ha I haven't told you this before, but you were my dream speaker when I started Ascend's Women in Leadership series. So it's truly an honor to be here with you. You're an inspiration. You're a force. And I'm so excited. It's going to be so fun together. Oh, thank you, Shivani. It's an honor to be here. And hello, everyone. I'm so excited to spend the next hour with uh, all of you. And, you know, just like Shivani, I, I like to think of the story of my career as just a series of mistakes. But, you know, learning from it and, and getting better, right? 1% better every day helps you be 67% better every year. Ooh, I like that. That's catchy. I love that. And so today, you know, you're, yeah, we already got our first nugget of advice. That's awesome. And so, you know, today, Julie and I are going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to take questions from you. So throughout the chat, feel free to throw any questions you want Julie to answer using the Q&A icon that's at the bottom right of your screen. You can add questions and upload them. We all want this to be really fun and valuable for you. So if something resonates with you, throw it in the chat, share that with us. With that, Julie, let's dive in. So, okay. you know, let's, as we all know, and I think that's why a lot of people are here today is becoming a manager is a huge inflection point in our careers, but no one ever tells you how hard the transition can be. So let's talk about that today. What was your experience like moving into management? What did you think it was like versus what was it actually? So when I became a manager, to give you a little bit of context, I joined Facebook right out of college and it was a startup at that time. So it was about a, about a hundred people. And many of the people, I would say the vast majority of the folks at Facebook were like me, you know, either college dropouts or recent college grads. And so none of us, of course, had any experience um, really even being managed, let alone managing. And so I started as a designer. I started as actually, I was hired as an engineer, quickly switched over to design. And about three years later, um, one day, you know, we were hiring really rapidly. We had two more designers who were joining in the next week. My manager sits me down and says, I don't have the bandwidth to go and meet with these new people that are joining. How about it? Like, can you go and manage them? And, you know, we'll just like tag team, I'll manage this group of people, you manage that group of people, will you do it? And, uh, you know, since I'd been working in that startup environment, um, I was like, okay, sure, like, absolutely, like, whatever it takes, right? I'm used to wearing lots of different hats, I'm used to just saying yes, and, you know, figuring it out. 
Uh, and I realized actually some, you know, immediately in my next couple of one-on-ones and it sort of dawned on me much more over the course of that next month um, and the next couple of months that honestly I had no idea what I was doing. You know, my, my, my concept of what a manager was, was I guess from prior bosses that I had had, as well as like what on what I saw on TV and in the movies. And so I thought that a manager, A, should be authoritative, B, should tell everyone else what to do, and C, should have all the answers, right? That's really, you know, my impression of what it is that a CEO or a leader and so forth um, would do. And to be honest, like those in, those assumptions really served me poorly um, because it then made me feel like, well, crap, I don't actually know what all the answers are and I don't actually know what I'm doing, but I should pretend like I do. Um, and I think I, I, I probably, you know, try to uh, talk the talk and I tried to kind of have the aura of, you know, authority and all of that. And in fact, that was a horrible mistake uh, because A, I think people can sort of see through it and B, it kind of prevented me from being able to ask for the kind of help and support that I needed. Um, and, and C, I think it, you know, it kind of creates distance between between you know, me and what I was trying to be versus the people on my team. So all this is to say, I got it all wrong from the beginning. Um, over time, what I understood management to be, um, and, and you know, kind of this is a definition that I talk about in my book is, you know, the job of a manager is simply to get better outcomes from a group of people that are all trying to work together towards a common cause. Right. So there's reasons why teams come together. You know, there's reasons why we have companies and organizations and nonprofits. And there's usually some outcome. There's some vision. You know, there's some change we want to make in the world. Right. And that can recurse all the way, of course, from like a whole organization down to what a specific team is trying to do. So, you know, you have that vision. You have, you know, what it is we're trying to do. That That is a great job. And the job of a manager is just to simply marshal all of the people and help that happen, you know, help them come together using the tools at a manager's disposal, which boil down to people, um, you know, who are all the people, what are their talents, how are they coming together, um, as well as the process, right, which is how do these people work, and purpose, which is what does success look like for that group of people, you know, what is the, the alignment of the vision uh, for what it is that this group is trying to do. I love that. I, I, I love how you broke. I think your perception of what management was is very similar to mine. I imagine a lot of people. I remember when I got promoted manager, it was like, I made it. It was this like career goal. And then very quickly, I just realized like, no, it's actually like so much harder than I thought it would be. It's not about just like telling people what to do. That wasn't the leader I wanted to be. And that's also like very short term gains. People won't want to work with you if you're just telling them what to do. And I that was the part of the book that really stood out to me. You talk about the best outcomes come from inspiring people to action, not telling them what to do. And I couldn't agree more with that, you know, from a principal's perspective and also from my own experience. So I'd love to hear, how did you inspire and motivate your team? What are one to two actions that we should take to be able to motivate our teams and really inspire them to take action? So I think there's really two key things when it comes to, well, what, where does motivation come from, right? And the first is, you know, is this person's strengths and um, and what they want to do aligned with what it is that this group of people, you know, again, that you're the manager or you're the leader of the team, like what it is that this group is trying to do. And I think that's the most foundational thing, right? Because if that's not there, you know, if actually what this employee cares about and wants to do with their life is not that well aligned with what, you know, this team is coming together to do, then you kind of have a foundational mismatch, right? And it's going to be very hard to actually motivate that person because frankly, they're, they have, they're in a different mind space. They have a different vision and a goal. And, you know, I always think like life is too short for, for all of us to kind of be stuck in a job or a role where we're really not that passionate about it. And if that's the situation, then, you know, we should probably just recognize that and say, it's okay to part ways. Um, and, and so you, you won't know that though, unless you know the person well enough to be able to have those conversations and to truly understand, okay, like if this person is on my team or, you know, I'm, I'm working closely with them, what do they care about really? And what motivates them? And how do they think about their job in the context of what they want out of life? Um, and so, 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 and of course, being able to have those conversations does mean you, you have to 
have built enough trust, right, that that person would be willing to share that with you, you know, and, and to do that often it's, you know, you've got to be willing to open yourself up and, and meet them at that level and, and talk to them too, right, in, in, in that kind of conversation. But the first thing is really build that bridge of trust, build that foundation, really understand what does that person love to do, what are their strengths. Now, the second thing is once you know that, then the second part of motivation is like, okay, so then are we able, to, you know, are you able to then convey to them and tell a story about why, what they can bring and what they're good at, or maybe what they want to do, um, why it matters for, for, for them, you know, to, to take on this task or this project, like what is that going to do for the team as a whole? And how is it ultimately going to further the mission of the team, the organization and the company? And to me, this goes back to just like going into explaining the whys, right? You know, if I just said, hey, Shivani, go and do this task and it doesn't make sense to you why this task matters, you're probably not gonna be that motivated. You're not gonna be that inspired, especially if you think the task is stupid or you know it's some busy work. But if we have a conversation and we're able to go into, okay, this is why the task matters. The reason why is because we're trying to do this bigger thing. And the reason why that bigger thing matters because you know it sort of, it, it all, all the way connects to, again, this vision and this mission that, that, that brought everyone together to wanna do then you know everyone feels connected right it's like okay my work matters i can see why doing this is going to be good for all of the our team it's going to be good for the organization and it's really to be able to connect the thread and it's really able to i think weave that narrative and that story um and and so everything you know everything from like big projects to little bugs to tasks i think if you could find a way to talk about the why of it, it is hugely impactful for people because once they see the why, then they also, you know, you should trust them on the how um, and they'll figure it out because they're smart and they're talented. But if the why is there, then, then you know, everyone is going to be kind of rowing towards the same place. Yeah, I love how you wrote that down around, you know, understand what are people's motivations because it's all everyone's built differently. So what you like may not be what I what I drive off of. And then also breaking down that why it seems so simple and and actually in practice it is like you know just add on a couple one more sentence and be like and here's why you should do it but we forget to do it and it, it's important practice to build just from the, whether it's with your report or really with anybody you're asking for support from or like asking making an ask around you know i we've been talking a lot about like you are the way you're breaking down these management techniques is so articulate and like so well thought out, you know, you're an expert in management. You've written a best-selling book on how to be a great manager. So I have to ask, have you ever struggled with self-doubt or imposter syndrome as a manager? Can you like shed some, like give us a little sneak peek into that? Absolutely. And I think I say this in my book, but honestly, it took me years. I would say it probably took me three or four years, you know, which sounds like insane, right? But but it, uh, to really feel comfortable being a manager and probably at that point, you know, again, six or seven years until I, I felt more settled in and I wasn't just every day looking in the mirror, asking myself, like, what did it, what am I doing here? You know, like, why did someone think that I was prepared for this or that I, I had the tools to be able to do it? And the way that I think about imposter syndrome is, um, you know, oftentimes it's this feeling of discomfort, right? And you don't know if you are prepared for this thing and you don't know if you can do it. And frankly, it is totally normal because how can any of us be expected to know how to do something if we haven't done it before? And, or, or for, you know, in some cases, maybe not even had the training to be able to do that, right? I think that's almost like an impossible ask that, you know, you could be invited or asked to take on this brand new challenge um, or go through something that is completely new to you and somehow feel 100% at ease in that situation. I think that's actually just, it's impossible. And I don't think that that's a realistic expectation for anyone. And so it is okay. And it is totally normal in those situations to be like, okay, you know what, I don't feel ready. I don't know if I can do it. I'm not sure that I have what it takes. But what I've learned, um, and so and you know, going back to your initial, like I still feel that way today. You know, I am now uh, founding a company. I'm a first-time entrepreneur. You know, we're building teams. We're doing this remotely. All that is new to me, and there are definitely still days where I wake up and I'm not sure that this is all going to turn out okay. 
But what is different for me now um, in my experience of dealing with that uncertainty is I, I actually have much more confidence in my tools and in kind of you know the, the tool belt that I've um, been able to assemble over the years on how do I work through that feeling that I'm unprepared and that maybe I'm an imposter. And a lot of these tools you know, are through this type of trial and error and what's kind of helped me in the past, right? I think the first is just to understand that it's normal I almost like to repeat that as a mantra to myself, like, it's okay to feel this way. Yes, Julie, you are really nervous. You're a nervous wreck. You're anxious about this. That's okay. And other women, everyone you've admired, you know, in the past as a leader has felt this way. And, uh, and that I think just immediately helps me feel a little bit less alone, right? So that's almost like an instinctive reaction now. I think the second tool is, of course, built finding a support group and, uh, and people that I can turn to. And I think I used to be much more reluctant um, to ask for help. Again, I think this came from my earlier days of assuming that when you're a manager, you should have all the answers. And if you don't have the answers, it's kind of like a sign that you don't have what it takes. So like, don't ask anyone for help because then they will definitely see through you and know that you know you don't have what, what uh, uh, and now I, I tell myself, well, if everyone feels this way, then it's totally fine for me to go and ask for help. And let me just think through, are there people that I know who may have gone through this experience in the past that I'm going through now? And I can reach out to them. Maybe you know they can send me some thoughts over chat, over email. Maybe they'll have coffee with me and just sit me down and give me advice. And you know, the networks and the communities that we built, like there's so many people who are willing to help, right? Of course, not everyone, and that's not the expectation that everyone you ask can sit down with you and, and talk through things. But but I think if you ask, you will find that there are people who are willing to do that. And it is so incredibly helpful to have someone else sit down and say, look, I've gone through it before. I feel you. You're going to be okay. I believe in you, right? And, you know, Shivani, you and I are talking about how sometimes like that that is what it takes to be able to give you what you need to then continue on in your journey and i think that's also what i love so much about ascend as a program you know is that you're creating that for a communities of women to be able to give each other that kind of support so the second tool in the tool belt is is just going and asking for help asking for support uh, i think the third thing uh is you know being open about the fact that I don't have all the answers. And again, this is something that I didn't know when I first started being a manager. But what I found is that when I can go to my team and someone asks me a question and we're do or we're going through something that we've not gone through before, right? If I can just say, you know, guys, this is hard. It's hard for all of us. It's hard for me. We have not gone through this before. I don't have all the answers, but you know, we're, we can get through this together. And I want to hear everyone's ideas. I want to hear all the solutions that you might have for how we might tackle this problem together. And in doing so, I mean, there's, it was so powerful, right? Because A, it's, it's powerful to be able to admit that you don't know something, but it also is one of those things that other people then trust you more because who among us actually always feels like they know the answer all the time, right? If you can be authentic and you can admit hey, I don't actually know the answer, but I also, um, I, I believe that we collectively together can figure it out. You're also giving power away you know, to other people on your team. You're sort of saying, hey, you know, I'm, I don't have to be the one with all the answers. Again, my job as a manager is to just make sure that all of us collectively together get to a better outcome. I don't need to be the person who comes up with every answer. In fact, I'm going to be the one that comes up with probably a, a very small number of, of the, the answers to the problems that we have because I'm just so far removed from the work, right? It's going to be the members of my team who, who end up doing that. And so being able to admit to them and then also just sharing the problem with them so that we can all have the uh, opportunity to work on it together, that's, that's the third, I think, powerful tool in terms of why I feel now when I don't have uh, when I feel that imposter syndrome, it's like, okay, but I, I can now go and do one of these three things and I'm, I know I'm going to feel better and we're going to kind of get through it. I love all of that. Like, I'm just like, I've just been like nodding my head and like, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I, you know, I relate to so much of that, but really all of that. When I got promoted to manager, I had so much self-doubt that I held back from asking for a raise because I was afraid that if they had to pay me more money, they might decide I'm not worth it. And really, it was just like that realization a few months later is like, everyone's new to management at some point in the beginning. And it seems so obvious now, you know, and you called this out too. It seems so obvious, but like in the moment, like I just got so caught up in my own head. And what you're talking about, like having that community is it can be so helpful to pull you out of that. 
And as then, like, as you were mentioning, you know, it's been so powerful for our members to realize, oh, wow, I'm not alone. A bunch of other smart, qualified women face the same challenges as me. And once you have that support, once you've gone through those experiences, it's so much easier to just like pull yourself out. And, and like, and like, I also still struggle with a lot of self-doubt. I was definitely nervous coming on to our conversation today. I was like, you know, you're a role model. I was like, oh, whoa, like, it's going to be like amazing. But also like, like, yikes, like, I hope this is good. And so, uh, but it's, you use the lessons that you have and then you just like put yourself in check. And, and so thank you for sharing that. Like so many good tidbits, the chat's on fire. So I think people are also like really enjoying your advice. Let's continue with the theme of self-doubt and anxiety. As a manager, we are put into many situations where we don't have the full context or it's new to us. For example, I remember thinking when I did my first performance review, so I was the one delivering that performance review. I remember thinking I was more nervous than the person actually receiving that performance review. And so how do you lead with confidence in these unexpected situations? What advice do you have for us? Yeah, I, I love that you brought that um, example up because I felt the same way when I interviewed someone for the very first time, you know, like I'm asking them questions. I was like, oh God, I hope that they don't think I'm an idiot and therefore not want to join my company because of how I come across in this interview, which is crazy, right? Because again, they're, I'm not the one being assessed here. I'm not the one who's looking for the job, but you know, these things are always getting to our heads. And again, you know, it's, it's normal to feel that way. It just tell yourself it's okay and that you do it multiple times and, and you get better. Um, you know, I, I think one of the philosophies that really changed um, how I thought about things is, uh, is the book Mindset by Carol Dweck, um, which I highly recommend for everyone. And, and I think that there are still times, you know, when whenever I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I find that oftentimes it's because I'm in this kind of fixed mindset where I think that people are are judging me, right? And like everything that I'm doing is in some ways a test of sorts. You know, I'm going and giving this speech and my, the little voice in my head is like, don't mess up, you know, don't be an idiot. Don't have people think that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and that's true, you know, it's like, and I think that's the same feeling that we had, you know, when you were giving a performance review or when, um, you know, I was interviewing uh, the, the person for the very first time. But I think there's another way to think about it. And this is what was so powerful for me when I read Carol Dweck's words in Mindset, which there's an alternative mindset, which is called growth mindset. And the idea of growth mindset is that, you know, you are where you are, right? On any skill, you know, you're, let's say you, you, if you think about a spectrum of like from zero where you don't know anything at all to mastery at a hundred, you know, for every skill that you can think of, you're somewhere on that spectrum, you know, maybe you're like at a 70 on this and a 30 on that. And, um, and, and what happens with fixed mindset is like, you're, you know, if you're a 30, let's say on something, right. And you wish you were a 60, you're thinking about every single you know, example of, of you going out there as, as people are judging you and you're like, oh, I hope they judge me at a 60 and, and not a 30. Uh, but when you have a, a, a growth mindset, you're sort of like, okay, I'm a 30. That's fine. Every single day, I'm just going to be able to in, improve on that spectrum, right? And if I put in effort and if I try and I take the time and energy to truly, you know, practice this thing and improve, then I'm going to be a 31 tomorrow and I'm going to be a 32 and a 35 and eventually I'll get there. Right. And again, you don't have to compare yourself with other people because where you are and where they are might be different. You just have to compare with the you of yesterday or the you of last week. And it's extremely, um, I think, powerful to kind of, you know, almost like put all that external stuff away and to just say, okay, this is where I am now. You know, I might be interviewing this person for the first time. Maybe I won't do as great of a job. Maybe I won't feel as smooth or I won't come off with the best pitch for my company or I won't know how to ask the right follow-up questions, but I'm going to do this today and I'm going to do this again, you know, next week and I'm going to get better. And so if I do this 10 times, if I do this a hundred times, I will have eventually the confidence and the skills to be able to improve and get to where I want to go. And now, you know, that is also another, um, almost like, you know, I, I, like if I talk with other women, like that's a lot of times, you know, the frame that will take. And sometimes I need that reminder myself, you know, someone else has to say that to me. It's like, yeah, you know, even if I went and I gave a talk and I wasn't that articulate or I was sort of disappointed in, in how I came across, like, I know that it was still a valuable experience because it's allowing me to take away lessons for the future. And if we think about the arc of life or the arc of career, again, not as just like discrete moments in time where we get judged, but you know, that, that you will be a different person next year and your skills will keep growing, then it's kind of a fun 
game to play. You know, it's sort of like you can always get better and you can always improve and you can always take opportunities, whether or not you did them well or not, as, as a way to get to where you want to go. I love that. Yeah, it's, it's I, I think about it, like I'm pretty competitive myself. And so it's always just kind of like this learning, like, okay, well, next time I'm going to like fix this to go do it better. And I think also in reminding that we tend to be pretty hard on, hard on ourselves and like where you might think you weren't as articulate, everybody else probably thinks that you were, or even if they didn't think so, it's not a big deal. Is there something that you have to do to like train yourself to think about this mindset? Or is there any advice for people who are trying to be better at having growth mindset that you would give to them? Yeah, um, I think the first one is is just remind yourself all the time that you're not static, right? You're always a work in progress. And also, I find, again, it's this weird mindset shift where before with a fixed mindset, if someone gave me critical feedback, I would be like devastated because I feel like, oh, my God, this is a signal that I wasn't, you know, the 60 or 70 I wanted to be. And this is a sign that, you know, I'm actually not where I wanted. And it was like hard because it was almost like my identity was tied up in, you know, being uh, like the the version of myself I wanted to present. And with growth mindset, it's actually completely different, right? Because it's like, oh, like, well, if I got this feedback, that's going to totally help me get better next time. And it's almost like if I didn't get the feedback, I'm not going to improve. And so it's like this feedback is amazing. And, and I think that getting into the habit of seeing feedback as a really good thing, you know, as a thing that the more you collect, the stronger you will be because you're almost like giving yourself rocket fuel um, in, in, in you know, sort of that your engine of self-improvement. Um, um, that helps a lot, right? Because then you're you're kind of going out there, you're being much more proactive. You truly want to know the truth and and bad feedback doesn't hurt because you know that it's actually going to make you go grow much faster. And, you know, whenever I also think a lot about, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, if I look at myself and my position as a manager of like, okay, what kinds of people do I like to hire? Like what qualities actually matter? It was a um, really interesting observation one time when I realized that all the people I wanted to hire were the ones that were curious, that asked a lot of questions, that like always wanted, you know, feedback. They wanted to know how they could get better. And yet, like, I still had this thing where I kind of thought negative feedback was a bad thing. It's like, how do I reconcile those things in my head, you know, and, and it was also, you know, really refreshing to realize, like, well, yeah, I like these people. And I think they're going to be great employees, because I believe in their trajectory, right? I believe that it, they ask for questions, and they ask for feedback, and even if they're not amazing in their skills today, I believe like in a year or two, they're going to outpace the people who maybe came in at a higher baseline, but kind of think that they already know everything or don't ask any questions or don't really, you know, um, ask for feedback. And so that also helped me realize that about myself. Like if I went out there and I actively sought critical feedback and I actively, you know, tried to um, use that to help me get better rather than use it as a scoreboard of sorts, um, that, that, that really changed my relationship to how I saw external um, and, and how I, I kind of approached, you know, talking to other people about this stuff. Yeah, I 100% agree. I love any and all feedback because I know it'll just help me grow. And if someone isn't sharing feedback with you, then it's actually hurting you and so, like just embracing it around it. You know, we've been talking a lot about the manager role and I'd love to take it from the other perspective around us as reports. We all have managers and you know, the saying goes, people lead, don't lead companies, they lead their managers. Managers have an outsized impact on our day-to-day, -day, our satisfaction at work. How can we have a strong relationship with our manager? What, what should we be thinking about? What actions should we be doing to, to create that thriving relationship? Yeah. And I think this is one of those interesting things because like, obviously we can't always pick the manager that we have and, you know, certain managers, um, we would have much prefer to other types of managers, right? And sometimes you just have the manager you have. And then the question becomes, well, how can I make the most of that relationship? You know, how can I um, make that as productive as it can be? And I, I think that there's probably two important things that when you think about your relationship with your manager um, and in terms of, of you know, kind of uh, both like the knowledge and the context that both of you have, right? And the first question I always, you know, want people to reflect on is, do you believe that your manager knows what matters to you um, and what matters to you, meaning, you know, what your career goals are, um, what you think you're good at, what you think maybe you're not so good at, but you want to get better at, you know, where your, what are your hopes and dreams in five years? You know, what, how you, again, how you per perceive 
your job or work in the context of the kind of life that that you want to have right and um and i think if you can answer very honestly like yes i think my manager really understands that that's like okay you've got you climbed kind of the first hill and um, um and i think that's a really great start right but if you don't feel like your manager knows those things about you then the next question to ask is, okay, well, how can I make my manager aware of those things? And, and sometimes, you know, it can be scary, right, to kind of admit, again, your hopes and dreams to someone that, you know, maybe you don't have that type of, you know, very uh, open and, and trusting relationship with. But I think it is still so important to be proactive in making sure that the other person knows that. And, you know, the way you might do it is you might just say, hey, you know, in our next one-on-one, -on -one, like, do you mind if we talk a little bit more about, you um, you know, my career, I really want to share with you my goals and kind of how I see my role or my job or the next couple of years. And I really want to get your input and your feedback on how I can achieve those things, right? And, you know, your manager, again, at the end of the day is incentivized to help you succeed. Because if you succeed, that means the team is getting better off. That means they succeed. And so, you know, just naturally in the alignment of things, like they're much more on your side, right? Even if you you're not always maybe you don't always feel that way, but but they do they they are better off if you are better off. And so you know there's often a very good chance that if you bring up that as a as a as a query like that, they'll they'll say of course and they'll be there and they listen. And I think then you know you can try and be as open as you can about this is what I care about. This is what I want. If you want you know, if you're looking for a promotion and that's like really important to you and you want that in six months or a year, just say it. And I know that it was always hard for me to do that because I I sometimes felt that if I if I said that I wanted a promotion in a year, like A, are they going to think that I don't care about anything else? Like I'm just sort of like after the promotion or also maybe I didn't want to say it because uh, what if it didn't happen, right? What if I didn't actually have the skills to get that promotion and like now they're going to think I'm a failure because I wanted that and it wasn't, you know, like like who am I to kind of have that type of ambition? But if your manager doesn't know what you care about, like how do you expect them to help them help you find opportunities or be able to again craft a, uh, you know, like pick the right kinds of projects or you know think about you when an opportunity comes up and and they're thinking about who on the team should do that, right? The more they understand your goals, the more that they can be an advocate and they can have an eye out for opportunities and ways of supporting you towards your goals. So that's the first thing. That like does my manager know what, what I care about? I think the second thing is do I know what my manager cares about? You know, it's like, if they're gonna stay up late at night thinking about something, worrying about something on the team, like, do you know what that is? Um, and I think that the kinds of people who ends up, you know, being a uh, growing, or, you know, having great opportunities or getting promotions are the ones who are kind of thinking a little bit, you know, one or two levels ahead, right? Which is often putting yourselves in the shoes of what is keeping your manager up at night? What is success for your manager? What should your team as a whole be thinking about or doing that would help, you know, again, your, your, your group, your manager, and by extension, the company. And if you can often adopt the perspective of your manager, and understanding kind of what success looks like, you will then have the uh, window into, okay, wait, so that means if they really care about that, like, then, then this is a thing that's a problem. And let me go and proactively help with that, right? And if you do that, I guarantee you, it's just much easier for a manager to, to see you as someone who's really critical to the team, as someone who is clearly maybe, you know, is showing a lot of, exhibiting a lot of leadership. So those are kind of the two important questions to make sure that you and your manager are aligned on. That's so true. And I like how you broke down those specific things. And it's really easy to actually reflect and just be like, are you aligned on it? And then, or like go ask that manager to make sure that you're, that, you know, there is actually alignment instead of you just assuming that. And, and I love that you're like, you need to go tell that person because you're right. No one is a mind reader. You need to go explicitly have that conversation. For example, I've asked for every single growth opportunity, promotion, raises. And when you go ask for like, oh yeah, okay, let's go make it happen. Or maybe it's a no, but here's what needs to happen in order for you to get to that yes. But you need to start that conversation yourself. We have a question in the chat around managing up. So I think that's a really nice tie into what we're talking about right now. So how do you, the question is around if your management style is wildly different than your manager, who is more traditional, top down, I always know better than you kind of person, what do you do? And I think we can like, you know, like, what do you do if you and your manager have different styles? How do you reconcile that? How do you manage that? I often find, and again, this is obviously, you know, if you feel like you're at that level of trust, but I often find that sometimes having kind of what's a meta conversation, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, first and, and sort of establishing those, those kind of um, uh, different, it's like, so for example, the meta conversation, as we just pointed out, could be like, hey, I want to just talk about 
our different management our approaches to management. And I want to better understand, you know, your approach to management, like what you consider success to be, like how, what kinds of relationships you want to have with your reports. And I want to share a little bit more about, you know, how I see things, right? And if you can kind of talk about that as a at a meta level, you know, just like talk about the differences. What you're essentially doing is again building a foundation so that it, that your manager is more aware of in what ways are you similar, in what ways are you different, in what ways are your strengths, maybe their deficiencies, and vice versa, right? And so you can get to a better level of rapport with one another. Then once you've had that conversation, it's a little it's a lot easier to then be able to have conversations about specific issues, right? Specific people or like, you know, when you said that I felt this way about it and I wanted to give you that kind of feedback. So the first tactic is go meta conversation. The second is often, you know, be able to find a way to talk about and give feedback in a manner that connects what, um, uh, uh, th that connects like the point of feedback that you want with why will it be better for me and extension, the team and the company, right? So that's the other, it, just like, you know, I think we were earlier talking about if, you know, you can explain to someone, this is why this project is important. Here's the why. Oftentimes when you give feedback to someone and you say things like, you know, I'm maybe I'm the kind of person who really uh, thrives more with understanding, um, you know, what I'm doing well, right? And you, and you want to give and you want your manager to do more of that, but maybe that's not their style. You could say, well, you know, if that if I got that, I, I noticed that, you know, I respond much better to that kind of feedback, which gives me the confidence to then tackle more projects, which then like led to, you know, me doing all this stuff for the team. And so you can help them understand why doing these things are good for you and extension for your company. It's much easier sell than just being like, that's who I am and that's what I want. Yeah, I, I like to call it about tying it back to the why. It's not about you, it's about them, it's the impact of the company. And so framing it in a way that they would actually care about it, especially in those situations when people have different styles. I, I think it's really important. I love how you broke that down and those examples that you gave around it. One, you know, as since we're talking about reports, one of the questions in the chat is about moving into management. So it's about when you're trying to move into management, but you don't have management experience, but then they you're told that. Well, you need to have management experience and move into this role. Like huh? it's been like a catch 22. So like, how do you, what advice would you have people for navigate that situation? I think that it's, you know, management isn't like, like a binary, like all or nothing thing, right? It's a series of different skills um, and that a lot of these skills you can work on and you can do outside of just having that title and that as a responsibility. So I think about, for example, one of the management skills is like being able to be a great mentor and coach to other people. And so you know, if there are things that you can do, you know, you want management, it's going to be hard to get that job. Are there ways that you can practice that skill and add value to your team in doing so? For example, do you guys do summer interns? Are there new employees that are going to join in the next month? Can you volunteer and say, hey, let me be that person's buddy. Let me help them work on onboarding. Um, and let me, you know, or, or again, uh, can you naturally be uh, somebody who can be a support uh, or, a, a, you know, a mentor to, like, you know, to a colleague, right? And, and kind of develop a reputation as like, yeah, you're the kind of person that other people trust and that helps them become more effective in their role. So that's one thing that you can try and do outside of the context of having that as your title. I think the second thing might be like process, right? We talked about, you know, a lot of the job of management is being able to, um, uh, uh, you know, figure out what is the best way for people to work together. And so, you know, to practice the skill of process, you know, if there are opportunities in your team, let's say your, your manager needs to organize this, whatever, the, this, this, this talk or this onboarding or something, you might volunteer and say, let me help out with that. Or, or you might, you know, go into your team meetings and you might have suggestions for how the team meeting can run more effectively or, you know, where there are issues where people don't have the right information flow and let me go and figure out how we can solve that problem to make sure everyone has the all the information that they need. So there's lots of things that you can do around process uh, as well, right? Um, of course, you know, with, uh, with uh, you, you might volunteer to be the kind of person who interviews other candidates and develop your, your ability to assess um, and to attract great candidates to the team. That's something that's super important for management. And so I think if you look at just like, what is the job of a manager? break it down into its requisite parts and ask yourself, is there a way that I can practice that skill? I can do it. Um, then what you can do is go back to your manager and say, look, um, and you, can, you should also ask your manager too, like what do you believe are the most important skills that a manager does or what do you do, right? And 
what are the ways in which I can build on those skills, right? But when you actually have now developed all of those skills and you can go back to them and they can see that you've worked on them, it becomes much easier for them to then say, okay, when a role opens up, like you're gonna be someone that they have in the back of their mind to take on that role. I love that, like just breaking it down piecemeal instead of being like, yes, I haven't fully managed, but like here's all the roles of it and here's how I have experience around that. One popular question in the chat is around how do you be a manager, but also stay on top of your design skills? So you don't become someone who doesn't really know their craft, their field after 15 years. And I think we can translate this to like any field. So they're not stopping like design skills, coding, closing deals, launching marketing campaigns, building product. Like, so yeah, how do, how do you balance that technical skill with being a manager? Yeah, and I, I want to just come out and say, I think that it is likely unrealistic to expect that after many years of being in a management role that you somehow still have the same uh, ability to be in the craft of the work as somebody who is full time an individual contributor. I just think that that's likely an unrealistic expectation. And, you know, if you stop managing for or if you, if you continue managing for a while and you stop doing day to day design work, you stop coding, you stop, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, doing user research, you are likely going to get worse at those things, or at least you will not grow in them as quickly as other people who are spending all of their time working on those skills will be, right? And that is okay. Like, that is absolutely an okay trade-off. I think the thing you want to think about is what of those skills are important for you to be able to most do your job as, as a manager? And so for me, you know, with design, like, I absolutely cannot design to the level that most of the people who have, you know, been on, I've worked with on my team can do so. But what is important for me as a design manager is to still be able to have the eye, right? So I should be able to distinguish what is good design work from what's mediocre design work from what's like, you know, not so great design work. The skill is really important so that I can bring in the right people to join our team so that I can continue to attract, you know, the top tier talent. And also so I can, I can sort of see people's strengths and be able to apply the right person to the project that most needs that skill. So it's important for me to still retain my eye and that level of critique. But today my eye is much better than my hand. Like I cannot actually create the things that I think are amazing and it's quite frustrating for me to do so. Um, but, uh, but you know, I, I, I've, I've got to keep that eye sharp. I've got to continue to like actually talk with people. I got to understand like what it is that the great designers are doing or what's sort of the best process for people to do their design work. Um, so I think it's both knowing in your con context as a manager, like what is most valuable for you to be able to do your job and make those skills, you know, invest in those skills and then be okay letting go on some of the things and just knowing that if, you know, your team needs that, you should figure out the best person on your team to actually tackle that that specific icon design or whatever it is. Yeah, that, that's great. Thanks for the practical advice. And I think that's really resonating with people in the chat. And so it's good to know, you know, differentiating these are different skill sets, figure out what you actually need to be successful in your new role instead of what you previously needed to be in your previous role. This is all so many good insights. You know, before we wrap up, throw in the chat, what's your favorite takeaway? We have covered so much around what does a great manager look like? Struggling with imposter syndrome. How do you manage that? How to a strong relationship with your manager? Failure. How to, you know, we've covered so much. So throw in the chat, what's your favorite takeaway? What's one thing that you want to remember from today's conversation? Growth mode. To about love the tips on overcoming imposter syndrome. Yes, so good. So many practical tips, which uh, like all over, like with every response, so that was super helpful. Relationship with your manager. What can I do to prepare myself to be manager? This is great. Yes, for sure. How to get in management without experience. Great. Yeah, these are all really, really good. Julie, thank you so much for joining us. This was awesome. How can people find you? So you can find me. I write a lot. I actually, my goal this year is to do like like kind of an essay, but in Twitter format. So I'm doing that once a week um, about management or design or product building. So um, at, at J-O-U-L-E-E. -E. I also have a blog, which now is just sort of a summary of all of these Twitter essays. Um, it's called The Looking Glass. And I have like a very large archive of blogs and other things, um, either on Medium or through my Substack, And of course, my book. Perfect. I love your tweets and I love your book. So if you haven't read Making a Manager, go read it. And thank you to all of you for all your amazing energy, questions, and chatter. You helped make this conversation so fun. 
And, you know, if you found this conversation today valuable and you want to develop the skills and tools around the topics we talked about today. So being able to influence, getting the habit of building, explaining the why, having your ideas taken seriously, rallying stakeholders, empowering your teams, then I'd love to work with you in a sense leadership program. The program starts starts at the end of June. The six, it's, it's a quick, six week program. It starts on June 28th. Lola is dropping the link in the chat to apply. It takes eight minutes. And mention that you attended today's conversations and we'll fast track your application when we see it since the program is almost full. I love the group that's coming in. We have women from Twitter, Google, Slack, Wayfair, Amazon, Hopin, and so many other companies. The energy is so, so good. So if you want to join us, apply now. We will send out the recording for today's conversation. Julie, thank you again so much. This was amazing. And you're, you're an inspiration, a powerhouse. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stefani. And thanks to everyone who tuned in. This was so fun. Yeah, same here. This is awesome. This is so fun. Take care, everyone. Stay well. And we will see you soon. Bye for now. Bye.